Good morning and uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pedro Arduino. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I am also a COGBI uh, member. I will be uh, this uh, webinar moderator. Uh, COGI is the Committee on Geological and Geotechnical Engineering, and uh, is the, one of the standing committees of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Board of Earth Sciences and, and Resources. COGI was established as the focal point within the National Academies for government, industry, and academia on technical and public policy issues related to earth processes and materials, soil and rock mechanics, responsible human development and mitigation of natural and human hazards. If you have uh, questions about COGI, please contact Samantha Maxino from the National uh, Academies. She is uh, one of the uh, staff directors there. This webinar is part of a quarterly webinar series produced by COGI through the support of the National Science Foundation. This webinar will be posted on our YouTube and announcement will be sent out when it is available. Um, first, I would like to thank Samantha Maxino, Sarah Hidrich, and Mandy Enriquez for helping us to organize and produce this, uh, this, um, this webinar. Uh, Dr. Martin McCann, who is the COGI chair, is also will, will, will help us today field questions from participants following the presentation. The audience can submit their questions at any time using the Q&A tab on the Zoom panel on their uh, screens. We will pose and respond as many questions as the time permits. First, a small disclaimer. Any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by Mr. Franz or anyone during this webinar are those of the individuals and do not represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, or Medicine. So without uh, more uh, of this uh, uh, introduction, I would like to introduce you our speaker, uh, John Franz. Mr. Franz, uh, we are really happy to have you here today. He has more than 45 years of consulting engineering experience. Most of his technical work for the past 37 years has focused on dams and water retention structures. He has been responsible for the analysis, design, and construction of embankment and roller compacted concrete dams and their appurtenant structures. He has served on numerous senior technical review boards and panels for dam safety projects for the US Department of the Interior, Bureau of Reclamation, the US Army Corps of Engineering, BC Hydro, and Brookfield Renewal Energy. Mr. Franz has, uh, was the team leader for the independent forensic teams uh, tasked with the investigation of the 2017 Oroville Dam spillway incident and the 2020 failures of Edenville and Sanford Dams. With that, we are really happy to have you, John, here, and the floor is yours. Uh, Pedro, thank you very much. Um, a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, we had a large number of subscriptions for this uh, webinar. I'm not sure how many will actually show up for the live version, but uh, that's very heartening to me because I, I feel the, uh, uh, the findings we've had at Edenville are uh, important. And uh, I'm really um, looking forward to sharing them with you today and, and glad to see there's so much interest back early in my career I did a lot of work in, in liquefaction with uh, uh, Gonzalo Castro and the late Steve Poulos including some research funded by NSF and here late in my career I'm uh, finding liquefaction coming back uh, into my life in a significant way again so with that I'm going to start going through uh, what I want to present to you today, and it's a lot of information, so it'll go fairly quickly. We're going to talk about the chronology of these events, talk about the physical mechanisms that we believe explain the failure of these two dams in Michigan, um, talk a bit about what static liquefaction is, what we believe is our evidence that supports that as the primary cause, uh, a primary failure mechanism at Edenville. Uh, briefly tell you where our independent forensic team work goes from here and then close with some, some of my thoughts on what I think are the ramifications of this finding uh, for, uh, for our profession. 
Uh, I want to begin by most of you have probably seen this, uh, but um, I want to uh, want to go through and try to run this video for you and uh, see if um, this is the video of the Edenville Dam failure. And this is real time starting 535 p.m. on May 19th, 2020. It's about a 40 second video. Uh, and really is pretty astounding. And quite frankly, without this video, I don't know that we would have been reaching the conclusion we reached. It was a, a very significant piece of evidence in, in our work. Um, and uh, I will talk a little bit more about how that video came to be as we go through the chronology of events, but just wanted to start with that if you had not previously seen it. Um, the Edenville Dam and the Sanford Dam are two of four dams owned by uh, an organization called Boyce Hydro at the time. Uh, the four dams owned by Boyce Hydro are Secord, Smallwood, Edenville, and Sanford from upstream to downstream on the Titabawassee River in Michigan. Uh, uh, the Edenville actually spans both the Titabawassee and one of its tributaries, the Tobacco River. Uh, fans across both of those, but the four dams are in sequence on that river. Uh, They're all better power dams built in the 1920s and operated since then. Uh, Edenville was not operating as a hydropower dam at the time of the failure because its license had been revoked back in 2018. There are three other dams in the basin that contributed flows into the, uh, the Boyce dams, but our focus is principally on uh, the Boyce dam. Uh, this was a rainfall event on principally uh, May 18th and 19th, uh, 2020, and this is the rainfall pattern. Apologize that the image is a little blurry when it when it uh, is enlarged, but our, our dams are located here uh, in this general area of Michigan, and you can see that a bit to the northeast, uh, there was over seven inches of rain, but in this basin, it really was typically four to six in the basin affected by the dams. Uh, in particular, uh, at the four dams themselves, if we tabulate the rainfall that happened, there was a little bit on the 17th. Principally, most of the rainfall was the 18th and then tailed off some into the 19th. And, and the maximum rainfall there is, you know, approaching six inches uh, in the, at Secord Dam, a bit less, more than three to to four inch range in the other three dams. So it was a significant rainfall, but not really an what we'd call an extreme rainfall for this particular part of the country. Um, the operations that were going on, uh, uh, the morning of the 18th, uh, water was beginning to rise in the lakes. All of these dams have gated spillways. So the owners started to operate those gates by the afternoon of May 20th, all of those gates were open and the, the lakes at that time were about their normal uh, water levels. Uh, so not very far off of the normal operating water level with all gates uh, open at that point. Uh, then uh, the rain continued and the water began to rise on all of these lakes by around midnight, Edenville, which is one that we're focusing mostly on the water, was over two feet uh, high uh, above normal pool. And by about one in the morning, it actually reached its previous uh, record pool at about two and a half feet, continued to rise and actually ultimately reached, uh, we estimate about five and a half feet above, uh, above the normal pool, three feet higher than it had ever experienced uh, before. Um, Edenville Dam itself, um, just to lay out the dam, it's about 6,000 feet long, uh, consists of four different embankment sections, tobacco right, tobacco uh, left, uh, Edenville right, and Edenville left. The failure actually happened over here in this Edenville left embankment section. Uh, in, there was a combination spillway powerhouse structure over here, three uh, gates, and then the power. Another spillway over here on the tobacco side, three gates. Uh, maximum height of this dam is somewhere around 50 feet, so it's not a terribly large dam. Over here at the section uh, that failed, the embankment height was actually about 30 feet. I um, want to now go through sort of the sequence of events that happened. Uh, early in the morning on the 19th, 
as the water had been coming up, the operators of the dam noticed that they were getting a lot of erosion on the upstream slope. So they deployed a contractor uh, out there to try to help put uh, silt fences and other material in to try to minimize that, um, that uh, erosion on the upstream slope. They did have some increased flow in the tow drains. Uh, mostly on the backbow side and parts of the, of the Edenville side of the embankment actually over here on this Edenville left. Uh, they didn't see anything going on over there. And for the most part, other than the erosion, there was nothing significant noted until about a half an hour before the failure. And about a half an hour before the failure, some residents on the upstream uh, left bank who had, that had been watching what was going on noticed that a depressed area developed in the crest relatively suddenly at about five o'clock in the evening on the 19th. Uh, and when that happened, uh, they walked around the left end of the dam uh, and walked uh, down to a substation, Consumers Energy substation that looked over the dam. And we're just watching with what was going on. And at about 531, so this is four minutes before the start of that video, this is what the dam looked like. Uh, and other than uh, the settled part of the crest right here, there's really not much going on. There's a little discoloration down here. I, I can't say for certain that that's not the, possibly some seepage coming out, but we don't think so. Uh, the, if you look at historic photos, there's variations in colors of this grass and uh, we're not, not convinced. If, if it was water coming out, it's coming out at a very slow rate. It's not flowing and it's not muddy. It's not anything going on to that degree. So I want to now, uh, with that background at 531, that's what it looked like. Um, I'm going to go through several uh, enlarged still frames from the video. So at zero seconds, we see this water coming down the face of the dam. Now we think that happened, we know it happened after 531 because the photo at 531 doesn't show it. And what the gentleman who took this photo, this uh, video said is that this water coming down the face is the reason he picked up his camera and started taking the video. So we think it happened really seconds before that video started is when that water started to come down the face. Uh, four seconds later, we see we start to get a little kick here at the downstream toe. Uh, then six seconds, so another two seconds later, really starts to bulge at the toe. Uh, we do have, have some, some water coming out here at this point. The crest is starting to sag. Seven seconds, it's moving even more. Eight seconds, 10 seconds. So between like six seconds and 10 seconds is when most of the action is taking place. We see water spouting out of uh, this mass as it's moving. Uh, and then at about 15 seconds, that mass of soil is laying down here at the toe of the dam. But Nothing else is going on here at that point. There's no water coming out until about 28 seconds when we start to see water start to come out. So we think this mass failed, left a remnant in place that stood in place for about 10 to 13 seconds and then started to give way and the reservoir started to, uh, to be uh, carried through, uh, uh, through the breach. Uh, at about 38 seconds, um, or 36 seconds rather, we have a full breach through the dam and that breach then just enlarges over the next couple of hours and, uh, and eventually uh, releases the entire reservoir downstream. Um, so uh, Sanford Dam, just before going back to Edenville and talking about uh, its causes, I'm gonna talk briefly about Sanford because it, its uh, mechanical or mechanism of failure is pretty clear. Samford Dam, like Edenville, was constructed in the 1920s, consists of embankment dams, uh, six gated uh, spillway bays, and a powerhouse. And then more recently, they built the fuse plug spillway to increase the hydrologic capacity of uh, Sanford. Uh, this is Sanford after the failure, and people were there watching the failure of Sanford, and it's really just clear that the amount of water coming through in the flood and then increased by the failure flood from San, from uh, Edenville was just more than that uh, gated spillway and fuse plug spillway could handle. Uh, uh, about uh, 7.45 in the evening, the water went over the top of Sanford Dam and it washed out by overtopping. So the mechanism is pretty clear. It's a, it's a 
traditional embankment overtopping failure. Uh, just spillways could not handle the, uh, the amount of incoming water and uh, the structure was overtopped. Uh, now, for Edenville, uh, as we went into this uh, investigation, one of the things we wanted to try to do was to understand the embankments, and particularly the embankment at the location that failed. Uh, and as probably not surprising, as often in the case in these uh, investigations, to conflicting information. The original specification said uh, that this uh, dam was going to be constructed with upstream and downstream slopes of 2.5 to 1 and 2 to 1, respectively. The slope at the failure section, according to topographic data we have avail available, was actually probably a little steeper than two to one. In places, maybe one seven to one and an overall of one nine to one or something like that from crest to toe. Um, the fill, according to the specifications, was supposed to be placed in layers and compacted. The upstream section was generally to be constructed of lower permeability material, the downstream of higher permeability material, and there was to be a clay tile pipe drains embedded in gravel spaced 10 to 15, 10 to 20 feet apart along the entire length of the dam extending from center line to the downstream toe. We're confident there was, those were constructed. We see them in construction photographs and quite a number of them were actually inspected back in 2012. So we know they exist and were constructed. As far as that other information about the specifications, were very dubious about the placement uh, methods or the zonation. Uh, previous test borings show the embankments com contain both clean to silty sands, some with low blow counts, uh, some as low as five blows per foot or less, and there also are clay sands and sandy clays in the embankments. Uh, construction photographs really don't show any compaction equipment and actually show some evidence of uh, sidecar dumping of fill uh, in the embankments in Edenville. Uh, breach photos, when we look at some of the breach photos from color differences, there's some indication of that, pot, that upstream downstream zoning being in place, but it's certainly not a slam dunk and the borings don't fully support it. Uh, the borings do, however, indicate that pretty much through underneath all of the embankments and certainly underneath the section that failed, uh, there was a a uh, clean sand layer extending from upstream to downstream under the embankment over a low permeability hard pan. Uh, over the years, berms and buttresses with filters were constructed at the taller sections of the embankment to address seepage and sloughing that had occurred historically. At the failure section, the failure section actually remained the tallest section of the embankment that did not have a berm or a buttress. So uh, what mechanisms did we think about for Edenville? Uh, four of them that we thought about very seriously and, and, and considered very hard. Embankment overtopping, internal erosion, or what's uh, historically been called piping, uh, what I call conventional static instability. And by that, I mean a conventional drain strength analysis static instability. Uh, and then lastly, static liquefaction flow instability. And that, Static liquefaction flow instability is where we ultimately concluded the, uh, the failure mechanism uh, to be, the primary failure mechanism to be, but I'll go through the other three first and uh, give you an idea of why we, we believe those are not viable. Uh, and then we'll talk about the flow instability in some detail. So embankment overtopping and photographic evidence it, it really is quite clear that the embankment was not overtopped uh, until up to seconds or perhaps minutes before the failure when we saw that stream of water coming down the downstream slope. Uh, the photo down there at the bottom, that's four minutes before the failure. There's nothing going over the top. And, uh, and the eyewitness saying that the water flowing down there was the reason he picked up his camera leads us to believe it really was seconds before and there wasn't time for that overtop to significantly drive this failure. And, and the, <clears throat> the kinematics, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the kinematics of what we see and I don't think are consistent with what we've historically seen in overtopping failures where the water comes over the crest, starts to erode the toe and head cuts its way back through the embankment, which takes longer than that 40 seconds that we see in the video and doesn't kinematically look like that. So we're quite confident this was not an overtopping failure. 
internal erosion. Um, there really was no seepage of significance ex exiting the ground surface detected. Um, really, we don't think we see any water on the surface until just moments before the failure. There certainly was no turbid water discharge seen in that, uh, in that uh, photograph at 531. Uh, we don't see an uh, opening pipe, a sinkhole, progressive sloughing, the kind of things that you see with uh, internal erosion failures, and the kinetics of that 10 seconds of failure duration really don't jive very well with, um, with internal erosion either. In addition, the soils that had been sampled in the embankment over the years and that we saw in the remnants on either side of this breach were, as, as I said before, they were uh, generally uh, sands and quite, quite uniform fine sands or clayey sands or sandy clays. And when you look at filter compatibility, there's really no filter incompatibility between those materials. There's no zone of gra open work gravel. And, there's, and similarly in the foundation, there's no open features for seepage to move material and, and uh, generate a, a internal erosion failure mechanism. Uh, we do uh, realize there is a possibility that there may have been some animal burrows up in the crest, up in the embankment near the top. <clears throat> it's also possible there could have been abandoned railroad ties from a railroad system they used for bringing in the fill. We think those may have contributed to that settlement we saw on the crest, but we don't think they're the primary driver for what we saw as the failure modes. So for all of those reasons combined, <clears throat> we don't think internal erosion is a very plausible explanation for what we see in that failure. <clears throat> the uh, conventional static instability, we've done some stability analysis that indicate the phreatic surface would have had to be extremely high to reduce the factor of safety below one with drain strains. And we would think if that were to happen, we would have seen breakout of seepage much higher on that slope. We would have seen water coming down the face from seepage. We would have seen some evidence of that higher phreatic surface. In, in addition, uh, the kinetics of the failure don't really are not really consistent with a conventional static instability failure. I would expect that kind of failure to be more progressive and slower. Uh, what I would envision happen would, the, would be the pore pressures would rise as the reservoir was coming up. The factor of safety with, with the drain strains might drop below one and you might get a bit of, of slope movement, but that bit of slope movement would actually be enough to res temporarily restore stability <clears throat> with some limited deformation. Then there'd be fur further rise in the, in the pore water pressures of the phreatic surface, decreasing the slope st stability of factor of safety below one again, and a bit more movement. And I, that would progress over time until there was enough deformation to cause water to, to overtop the dam. And then we'd have an overtopping or possibly an internal erosion failure from damage to the embankment. But that process, I just can't envision that all happening in, 40, in 10 seconds. And it doesn't look like what we see in that, uh, in that video. So for those reasons, we don't think this was a conventional static instability. So uh, static liquefaction flow instability, what is it? Um, it's a situation where the mobilized shear strength in a saturated loose sand or silty sand decreases rapidly to values significantly less than the applied static shear stresses. And I'll talk about how that happens. But what happens is that very quickly, the, the, the available mobilized strength is less than the applied static forces. That creates a, creates a force imbalance. And by the old force equals mass times acceleration equation, a force imbalance creates acceleration and creates velocities, and it creates the kind of flow slide behavior that we saw. <clears throat> that can only happen with a, a soil that has a brittle stress or brittle strain weakening, stress strain behavior. Sometimes it's been called strain softening, but uh, Kari Hug at uh, the NGI pointed out to me that he thought strain weakening in this context is a better term, and I agreed with him, and I've started to adopt that as the, as the term for this stress strain behavior. And it's illustrated here, and it's a behavior that is uh, typical of um, undrained shear behavior of loose saturated sand. 
And this is a, an example where we have a anisotropically consolidated um, sample. So it has some initial shear stress. If we load it undrained, it goes up to some peak strength. And then, and that occurs often at very low strain. And then it drops quickly down to a much lower steady state for residual strength as opposed to a ductile behavior, which would be the case in a drained test of this kind of material, where it would go up to a strength and stay close to or at that, that same strength for continued strain. In a stress path plot of shear stress versus mean effective stress, what we find if we look carefully at that stress path is that that peak undrained strength over here actually occurs at a obliquity that is less than the friction angle line and then as those pore pressures generate and the sample continues to strain down to the residual or steady, steady state, it eventually intersects that uh, drained friction angle envelope out here at the, the steady state. So that's the kind of behavior we're talking about. Uh, it's interesting, um, Greg Becker pointed out to me that um, it, it, in a historical note, the original term of uh, use of the term liquefaction that we've found in the literature goes back to the 1920s by Hazen when he referred to the failure of Calaveras Dam, which was a static instability failure. So quite interesting that liquefaction's first use was for a static failure. Uh, there are other historic examples out there, Fort Peck in 1938 during construction, uh, Wachusett's Dam in 1907, that was uh, studied by Scott Olson, um, and then that failed during first filling, and the upstream slope failed during first filling. But then liquefaction was later used in reference to earthquake-induced failures, uh, particularly beginning with the lower San Fernando Dam failure in the 1970s. And I'd say at this point in time, most geotechnical engineers associate liquefaction only with earthquakes. Certainly up until recently, that's been the case. And more and more, we're starting to talk about static liquefaction in large part because our, our tailings dams colleagues have been focusing on that after a number of failures, most recently, the Brumadino failure in 2019 in Brazil, a tailings dam in Brazil. And I'd actually uh, suggest if you haven't looked at it, look up the uh, video on Brumadino and look at it and compare it to uh, to Edenville. And it has a number of similar characteristics in that you see at the beginning of it, you see a little kick at the toe, and then it just progressively begins to move and accelerate and move faster. The difference being that um, in, in Brumadino, it's the entire width of the tailings dam that fails at once. Here at Edenville, we have a, a limited somewhere between 40 and 80 foot wide section of the embankment that fails while the rest doesn't. And I'll come back to, to why I think one possibility of why uh, it was just that, uh, that particular section. I think if you think about it uh, and what we know about earthquake induced liquefaction now, one could really suggest that all liquefaction flow failures are static uh, liquefaction flow failures. And I'll illustrate that in the next slide. I think we have come to understand now that if we, if we look at a, a static liquefaction or an earthquake induced liquefaction flow failure, what really is happening is we have uh, a sample or I have a soil in place that has driving shear stresses from gravity that are less than the drain strength, uh, loose sand material. The earthquake comes along, shakes it. And actually, if, if you could imagine if you did a, that, a, a monotonic loading of this, its stress strain curve would look something like this. And what the earthquake really does is drive it across under that peak, generating some pore pressures, and then it drops down to its a steady state strength. But what drives the deformation isn't the earthquake. The earthquake's the trigger. What drives the deformation is the strength drops suddenly to below the driving forces, that creates acceleration, which creates velocity and causes the flow slide to develop. So in a way, it's a static flow slide failure uh, triggered by the earthquake. Um, another interesting um, uh, test that's out there in the literature, interesting references out there in the lit literature, uh, came out of University of Alberta with a graduate student at the University of Alberta working with um, 
uh, with Peter Robertson and with uh, Nordy Morgenstern. And they did a quite interesting uh, test. Uh, what they did is a test where they uh, anisotropically consolidated a sample up to a certain point. Uh, they then left the drainage valve open in the triaxial sample, and they just gradually increased the back pressure. So they increased the pore water pressure in the sample while maintaining a constant shear stress. And in stress strain space, what happened is as that pore water pressure increased, in this case for about um, you know, four tenths of a percent axial strain, uh, the sample continued along at that constant stress, and suddenly at a certain point, it collapsed. And on its own, it collapsed and behaved undrained, generated high pore water pressures, and, and failed. Uh, and actually failed so quickly that they couldn't measure the, the prop, measure the, uh, the responses. And uh, it was done load controlled, and it's reported in their paper that the load frame came down so quickly and hit on the, re the restraints that they could feel it in the, in the lab. Uh, in a, the stress path plot, uh, we went up to this point, and then here's where they started that uh, increased pore water pressure. And out here at an obliquity corresponding to a mobilized friction angle of about 20 degrees, the collapse happened, even though the soil had a drained steady state friction angle of about 30.6 degrees. Uh, they did that particular test. They did a second one. Ah. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. There we go, that's better. Um, they did a second one at a different shear stress and got very, very similar results. They also compared this to what the stress path is for the monotonic loading, which is shown here in these open circles. And you'd see what happens is the sample actually moves across until it hits that monotonic loading, loading curve and then it collapses. So there's actually a state line or a state uh, plane uh, that when hit triggers this collapse and it triggers the collapse at less than the drain friction angle. So their conclusions from this is that you could have slopes that fail suddenly undrained if the soil is very loose and the pore pressures rise slowly in a drained manner. So drained increase in pore pressure triggers this failure. And that collapse boundary is, is at a friction angle significantly lower than the drain strain. The strain during that drain loading of the pore pressure building up is only 0 0.4, 0 0.6% in the test that they did. And with that behavior, uh, there really would be no clearly observable earth movements prior to sudden collapse. So the conclusion there is that even though you have a slope that may have a conventional factor of safety above one, uh, based on drain strength, the slope could actually be close to an undetectable catastrophic undrain failure. And from that, our uh, colleagues in, in tailings dam work have sort of uh, hypothesized that if we have a sample with relatively high shear stresses of a loose um, sand or silty sand with this brittle uh, strain weakening behavior, you could trigger these undrained failures by increases in pore pressure, increases in shear stresses, um, potentially sudden increases in shear stresses, or some combination of the two to follow those kind of stress paths. Now for Edenville, as is the case for most dam failures, unfortunately, we don't have exact material failed because it's been washed away and we don't know its exact characteristics. But for a demonstration, what we did is collect some samples from one of the embankment uh, remnants, uh, a clean, uniform, silty sand sample, uh, uh, prepare it to 30% relative, relative density, and test it at three different consolidation stresses in the laboratory. And you see that what we got out of that was this very abrupt uh, drop in strength. And it, that drop in strength began here at an instability line of somewhere around 17 to 18 degrees of obliquity compared to uh, 31 degrees of drain friction angle. So we demonstrated that there are materials in that embankment that if loose enough could uh, generate the kind of behavior that's consistent with static flow slide liquefaction. Um, in addition, 
uh, an ASC team did a study and they also reached a conclusion that the failure was likely uh, static liquefaction. Uh, one of the very interesting things they did is they did some pixel tracing of that video. They picked five uh, different points and traced them over time. Uh, this P5 down at the foundation they found did not move. So the movement really was isolated up in the embankment. And the other thing that they did is they calculated velocities and you can see the velocities here approached five meters per second or 16.4 feet per second and were predominantly horizontal. Uh, again, all consistent with a flow slide type behavior. We also did a, a simplified kinetic analysis of Edenville uh, following a, a procedure uh, that Davis had all developed. And we're still working on this and refining it a little bit, but the initial go at it uh, indicated that we could create velocities as high as 20 feet per second, which is in this general neighborhood of what the, the ASC folks came up with. And the whole failure would happen over a span of about six or seven seconds, which is not inconsistent with the time we see of, of the failure. So putting all of that together, we judged uh, static liquefaction flow instability to be the primary mechanism for the failure. And we believe that's supported by the accelerations and velocities that we see in that video. Uh, the strong evidence of loose uniform sand in the form of the, of the very low blow counts uh, from previous investigations. Uh, the strength loss behavior in the laboratory on loose samples taken from that breach remnant and the reasonably close match in, in the kinetic analysis. It's really, in, in my view, just very difficult to explain the kinetic failure or kinetics of this failure with any mechanism other than static liquefaction flow. Uh, a couple of contributing factors, uh, the lake was at a record high level. Uh, so that could, if indeed uh, uh, elevated the, wa the water pressures in the sand to levels high enough to trigger this where that had not happened before. Uh, and the apparent, there's apparent uh, lack of functioning foundation drains at the location of the failure, which I think helps explain why it happened where it did. Uh, in 2012, they did a, a inspection of these drains, actually extending a hose up into them. And in that inspection, we note that in this area where the failure likely happened, there appear to be drains that either were never installed or they are no longer functional because they couldn't find them and inspect them. So the lack of drains in that area certainly could uh, cause a, or, or could contribute to higher uh, water water pressures in that area than in the area where the drains are present. Uh, the triggering of the static liquefaction is a little harder um, to get our hands around. Uh, it, you know, we, we think there are plausible explanations, but we probably won't be able to reach a definitive conclusion. Increased pore pressures certainly are a, uh, are a potential trigger. And one possibility is through that foundation layer that I mentioned, that is the clean sand foundation layer under the embankment as the reservoir rose, it could have transmitted pore water pressures into the saturated downstream materials and also begun to raise the phreatic surface. Uh, it, there could have been flow through the embankment itself as that water rose, since we don't know whether the embankment had any zoning or not. It's possible that in the upper part of the embankment that had never been wetted before, there was a permeable layer going through the embankment that allowed water to come through and then rain down through the downstream section and raise the phreatic surface. It's also possible when that settlement happened on the crest, it opened up cracks that could have allowed more water through to allow those water pressures to rise. I, I think they're all viable. Um, uh, there's some degree of increased shear stress from the reservoir level, the higher reservoir level, but that's pretty small. However, the problem is with this section of the embankment having these very steep, steeper than two to one downstream slopes, the static shear stresses are already quite high and we could be very, very close to that uh, instability collapse line and not need much to trigger it over that line. And it's very sad, it's, it's on off when you reach that line the sample of the soil on its own generates these pore pressures and generates the collapse. It's also possible there could have been some shock load from an initial conventional static instability. I think all of those are plausible and it may be some combination of them. 
Um, to wrap up here, uh, the future work of the independent team, we're continuing to do some further analysis of the stresses and, and the stability analysis to refine our geotechnical analysis. We are evaluating the flood a bit further. One of the questions we want to answer is why did the lake go to this record level in that particular storm that wasn't that extreme of precipitation? Uh, we also are looking at the various decisions, actions, inactions over the years on this project and how did they contribute? Were there, were there opportunities to intervene with things that might have prevented this, even if you didn't understand the potential for static liquefaction. For example, if you thought uh, conventional stability was not adequate, you might have built a buttress or a berm, and that in itself might have stopped this failure from happening. Uh, we are working towards preparing a final report, including lessons to be learned, uh, with a target date for early uh, next year, 2022. Lastly, my thoughts on ramifications uh, of, the, of this finding. Um, Static liquefaction has not been considered traditionally for water dams, according to the existing guidance. Uh, geotechnical texts and dam safety guidance, uh, if you look at it, it says that you really don't look at high pore water pressures or undrained shear behavior in sands, except for rapid loadings like earthquakes. Instead, you use drain strength parameters. As I said, our tailings dam colleagues have begun to recognize that, that may not be true, but to my knowledge, there, there really hasn't yet been a guidance that's coalesced around how do we specifically deal with this issue of having these loose materials in place that could potentially trigger a uh, static flow slide when we don't understand the triggering real well. Uh, I think this failure demonstrates that static flow liquefaction is possible if strain weakening soils are, are present, uh, saturated loose sands and silty sands. Uh, it also begs a question of with the video being a primary piece of evidence, are there other failures in the past that may actually have been static liquefaction that we haven't recognized as such and that perhaps it's more common than we think it is? Because in general, the cases reported are pretty rare. I think the profession is now challenged to uh, develop appropriate protocols and guidance to address static liquefaction. Uh, and the IFT's work kind of ends when we put our report out and explain what we think happened and what we think the lessons to be learned are. And now it's up to our profession to, uh, to see if we can uh, develop some, some guidance about how we, uh, how we best deal with it. And with that, uh, Pedro, I'd be happy to uh, begin to address uh, any questions if we have any. And uh, John, uh, th thank you, thank you very much. A uh, uh, great, great presentation, and uh, with uh, uh, an incredible case with uh, very good information. So we have been uh, getting several, uh, several questions here from the audience, and uh, we are trying to organize them a little bit to see what how to answer them. But um, one that is very, very, very basic, um, and I, I know that you mentioned this. But ha, uh, what's the difference between static liquefaction and piping? So uh, I, I got uh, uh, several several questions with that. It's a very basic one. Can you can you give us? Some sure, more? sure. Uh, piping internal erosion. Um, what's going on with internal erosion is that the, the water flowing through the embankment or the foundation, through a variety of different mechanisms, can begin to move the solid soil particles, uh, and convey those solid soil particles out of the dam, out of the foundation, and then can either create a, a pipe or a void that extends back through the foundation or through the embankment uh, as it progresses, enlarges, and eventually allows the water to either uh, flow through that and, and fail the dam or possibly the crest of the dam to settle and, and the reservoir water to overtop it. But it's the flowing water moving particles. Um, where static liquefaction is all related to the, the uh, mobilized strengths and the applied stresses and is an imbalance in forces in, in, the, in the soil mass rather than from directly from the flowing water. Yeah, it's an imbalance of forces. That's the main, one of the main things that uh, at the moment of the triggering of the, of the event. So, uh, um, 
Uh, did you look at other sections? So when I, I, I saw the video, so the video is very good. So there were some remnants uh, of the cross sections that you could also consider or, uh, or look at. Um, the, uh, the, the, there were over the years uh, at, a, at a few sections of this embankment, um, there were uh, geotechnical investigations done with uh, test borings, with SPT samples, and in some cases, uh, even some tube samples, uh, and uh, some various analysis done, gradation, uh, uh, fundamental uh, soil properties, uh, out of our limits, those sorts of things. Uh, there were even some uh, direct shear tests done on reconstituted samples. There was all of that sort of information available. So we looked at that and that's where the, the general understanding that the embankment um, embankments are composed of this mixture of soils of different types. That's where that comes from. Um, and we um, did go out, uh, I didn't personally, but two folks on our team went out and did look at the remnant uh, sections on either side of the failure section and looked at those and mapped those and they were markedly different. The failure actually extended over very close to the uh, spillway structure and on that side the embankment was mostly clay material all the way upstream downstream. On the other side it extended almost to the abutment and it became a little hard to distinguish what was embankment, what was abutment soils. But that section tended to show somewhat of finer grain material on the upstream side, sandier materials on the downstream side. Uh, and that's actually where we took the sample that we tested in the laboratory. Uh, but we looked at those, we looked at the borings. Unfortunately, the boring data over time was um, mostly, almost entirely from either the, the crest or downstream of the dam at the toe. So we didn't have borings in the intermediate slopes. So it was very hard to determine much about the cross section. Uh, the, the, the taller sections of the embankment that did not fail, uh, in all cases, those taller sections had for various reasons of observed seepage or sloughing or different reasons, had, had the downstream slope flattened or a buttress constructed with internal drains put in place so from a stability standpoint, their stability had been improved. And this section that failed was actually the tallest section of the embankment still existing that did not have a buttress or a flattening constructed on it. So what, what do you think that uh, the Edenville Dam was under distress at multiple locations at the same time, or it was just this one uh, unlucky section? Um, I think this one was probably the most critical. It probably had the, the highest um, static shear stresses before in place before the reservoir started to rise, um, just because it had the steep slope and was the highest section that didn't have the buttress. Um, and I suspect that other sections of the embankment, of that east embankment where this section was located, there were other sections that probably were getting very close to failure, but the, the lack of drains may have been the thing that, that kicked this one over. Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions here more related with internal erosion. One, of say, one says, an inspection report of Edenville Dam just a few months before failure indicated several uneven areas at the dam crest that could be a sign of internal erosion. What is your opinion in this regard? Uh, you know, it's possible. Um, however, um, I think if th those things may be subtle, in uneven crest, um, the number of different explanations you can have over time, uh, trafficking, trafficking on the crest by people, by vehicles, whatever, could lead to some of that. You also could get some e unevenness like that from uh, some settlements related to animal burrows that collapse from uh, um, the uh, from the old railroad ties that might have been left in place in the higher sections of the dam. In addition to railroad ties, they actually had a trussle 
that they were using to uh, to bring some of those railroads in, and they may have left some of those trussles in place. So you have you have potential rotting wood within the embankment. So those kind of things could produce the crest unevenness. Also, the the thing that we felt is that after we looked at all the gradation data we had on foundation and dam, that it's very hard to conceive of internal erosion leading all the way through to a failure mode without the water breaking the surface on either the downstream face or the toe and beginning to carry particles out at that location. So that would really be the indication. And from the, the reports that we've seen, that wasn't happening. They, they did have, and, and this is possible, this certainly was going on too, those foundation drains surrounded by gravel were not filter compatible with the sands. And they did at times have some reports of sediment in those drains. So they did probably have some ongoing internal erosion through those drains, but I think that would lead to a slow settlement, not to a rapid yeah. failure like we saw. So you show a couple of uh, one uh, slides with, you mentioned the, the, the work by Daniel Pradel. So we have Daniel in the audience here. <laughs> so he's asking some questions too. Uh, he said that uh, the AEC team obtained the drain strength by testing, performed transient analysis and found a low static factor of safety around 108. Hence, uh, did not exclude it in their publication as a possibility in addition to static liquefaction. So what, what is your comment? What factor of safety did you obtain for static liquefaction and how did you exclude it in your mechanisms? So what was the, the criteria for excluding it? <laughs> um, the, the, the criteria for, for excluding it is, and I think we, we're still working on some of our stability analysis also, but depending on the, on the phreatic level in the embankment, which unfortunately we have no data on, uh, because they did not have any piezometers in place at this section of the embankment, so we don't know. We can run some, you know, we're going to run some seepage models to try to get phreatic surfaces, but the problem is we don't really know the cross section very well either. So, for a hypothetical cross section, we can run phreatic surfaces. If we were to do a phreatic surface with a uniform sand cross section, I think we get. Uh, static factors of safety very similar to what Daniel mentioned. Um, the, the biggest reason that we lean very strongly to static liquefaction rather than, uh, than convent, what I call conventional instability is the kinetics. Is uh, I envision that if you, that calculated factor of safety of 108 and if the phreatic surface rises a little more, you can certainly get less than one. But if the stress strain curve does not have that brittle collapse behavior, I can't get to the kinetics. Mm -hmm. So it really is the kinetics and the speed and, and the match uh, when we do the kinetics model that was leading us to believe that static liquefaction is the, is the most likely explanation rather than a conventional instance. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So is the is the kinetics of the problem that is uh, guiding you in the method that in the mechanism that you think is yes. the worst. And, so and that, I, I didn't present it, but we also did and, and uh, will present in the final report. We did do a drain triaxial test on that same sand at 30% mm -hmm. relative density. And mm -hmm. they are not strain weakened. They are not, they're not brittle at all. They're a very ductile behavior. So it, in a drain stress drain behavior of that loose sand, you would expect it to do more like I described in the slide where it would go maybe to 0.95, it slumps a little bit, it stops. Uh, the phreatic surface comes up, it slumps a little bit more and goes and not this very high velocity movement that we saw in the video. So, so, so let, me, let me switch a little bit and then, then I will be back to the, to the, to the physics. But uh, I have here a question by Eric Halping. And he says, and the rapid nature of the failure implies traditional inspection and monitoring would be ineffective in being able to intervene. However, some INSAR analysis indicates that even with brittle failures, there is some small indicators 
uh, weeks or months ahead of the failure uh, if they can be measured. What, any comments on these technologies that could be used? Um, you know, I, I, I have heard some of those technologies. I've um, uh, seen some of them. And, and yes, I think they do potentially have some, some usefulness for us. And I think, to me, that's sort of part of the challenge to the profession is recognizing, first, I guess we have to decide whether the profession agrees with our conclusion that this is what happened and that this problem now exists. And it's a problem that now exists that we haven't been addressing. And then I think we need to start thinking about how we best address that. And exactly questions like that are things, things to be addressed. Because if you, if you look at this compared to the way we deal with earthquake liquefaction, it's an interesting uh, comparison because our, our procedures for doing earthquake liquefaction now are to first look at if we have low blow count sands, the first First thing we do is a triggering analysis is do we think the earthquake uh, loading is enough that it will trigger the liquefaction <clears throat> the next thing we do then is, is okay if the liquefaction is triggered does that would that lead to instability and if it does then we usually do a remediation for it well this one's a little trickier now because what it really says is if you have these loose sands in place we're not right now fully understanding the triggers how comfortable can you be if those loose sands are in place and they could sit there right on the brink of that collapse line and then suddenly trigger? So I, I, the, Eric's suggestion, I think, is something we need to think about. But the question will come, how confident can we be that that kind of monitoring would give us sufficient warning so that we would, we would know what's happening? Yeah, as a follow up, you know, Devon and McLeay here from G Engineers is asking, uh, was the owner or all regulators aware that this section of the embankment was maybe critical uh, for the reasons you discussed before the failure or this was just an apparent uh, uh, hindsight in, in retrospect? Um, well, that's a, another thing we're going to be addressing a bit more in the final report is when we look at the the history of the um, geotechnical evaluations and analyses that were done on the project, it, it seems that they were, they tended to be reactive. Um, they tended to be a situation where some seepage or wet areas were observed on the slope, maybe a little bit of sloughing on the downstream slope. Um, somebody came in, did an investigation of that area, did some stability analysis on it, concluded, well, we should put a buttress or on it or we should flatten the slope we should do something about it but there was not over the history a systematic let's look at all the sections and and after these buttresses had been put on the other taller sections to the best that we can tell at this point no one asked the question well what's the stability over here at this remaining tallest section that doesn't have a buttress yeah. So the regulators were not aware, but and that that's one of the questions is should we have been aware? Yeah, and you know we are we are getting close to the to the time here, but I was I, I have a personal question here. Um, it seems to me that we need to understand better static liquefaction here, <laughs> and that's one of the outcomes. Do you think that with the type of uh, lab uh, test that we do, is is possible to get this steady state? points, uh, how, how much deformation you need to reach these steady state points? Um, well, with, with these sands, like we're talking about here, and I actually did a lot of this with, uh, with Gonzalo Castro and Steve Poulos back a long time ago when I was a young buck. Um, and uh, we did a lot of those with the, with the cleaner sands and even silty sands. The cleaner sands, certainly, uh, it, it's very typical that that peak stress happens at 1%, 2% or less. And by 10% strain, you drop down to that residual or steady state strain. As it gets siltier, the stress strain starts to stretch out a little bit, but we still were pretty successful with silty sands uh, getting down to uh, getting steady state strength within the, the limits of a conventional triaxial test. Um, as it gets very silty, or in particular, if it starts getting plastic, 
it gets harder and harder. Uh, but I think for a lot of the sands we would be worried about in, in this kind of phenomenon, you, you can actually get there. So you cannot get, or you need to devise something new to try to get to that. I don't know, because this could be happening at, I don't know, 50% deformation, 100% deformation. <laughs> and so it's very, it's, it's difficult to have a piece of equipment to, to handle this. With, with those for sure. Yeah. So, um, so we are we are exactly at, at the time, and uh, you know I don't know uh, we have we have been receiving questions and questions and questions, <laughs> and uh, but uh, and we can continue if uh, if, in, if if possible um, for the people that uh, they don't have time this uh, this uh, presentation is being recorded and is going to be distributed in the U YouTube channel a huge a YouTube channel. But uh, I have one final question that maybe you can address for everybody and maybe then we can continue more. So, and it says the findings of the auto bill for N6 teams indicated there are systemic issues with respect to the way in which dam safety is managed by owners, consultants and regulators in the US. The Eden bill failure brings to light a, a mode mechanism of failure that has not been focused for water retention stru structures, albeit a static leak function is not new. Uh, what are the implications of the finding of these two events to dam safety? Okay, um, I, I, one of the things I think we're seeing in, in Edenville that uh, we also saw in Oroville, and we mentioned there as a lesson to be learned, is the need to, um, to not uh, so much depend on physical visual inspections of our dams as a primary uh, method of managing dam safety, but to at some point, and then perhaps periodically after that, to periodically go back into the history of the structure and do a more comprehensive review of what do we know about how it was built, um, uh, how it's performed, and whether there are issues that perhaps need to be addressed. And, and the questions uh, I, said, I suggested that that raises is one question is, how does it, does it compare with uh, modern dam safety practice? Is this, was the structure designed, built according to sort of modern dam safe, safety practice? If it wasn't, how does it deviate? And are those, do those deviations potentially uh, present a risk? And then that should that, if that's true, then you need to look at that further. So I think that lesson still remains. And, and the FERC in, in its new guidelines is trying to address that with modifying its FERC Part 12 procedures to have some of these comprehensive reviews. So that's a, an important aspect of that, I think, uh, that, that that's ongoing. But state dam safety programs, and some are doing that already, need to start doing that too. Um, the, the aspect of it, of this one being a, a, a mechanism that we haven't looked at, I think part of the reason of that has been that it it is relatively rarely been reported. Uh, you know, you, we've got Wachusett, we've got Fort Peck, maybe we've got a few others, and now we have some of the tailings dam instances. So that makes us think, well, it's not that big a risk because it doesn't happen that often. But maybe we need to rethink a little bit. Well, even if it's not that big a risk, do we still need to understand and, and, and understand that it's possible? and make that risk decision of whether we can live with that risk or not. So oh, I think it does open up some of those kind of questions. Yeah. So um, I think that for the benefit of uh, the audience, I think that we should, uh, we should stop um, we should stop here. And uh, we have plenty of more questions that we are going to distribute to you, uh, John, in case that uh, maybe you want to look at them and and maybe answer some of these uh, these questions, and we can maybe produce a little uh, document with some answers to these questions. So we can discuss later that uh, to you. I see that uh, we are losing some people in the audience here as we go. Uh, so before we conclude, I want to thank everybody, everyone, to uh, to attend. The webinar uh, will be posted, as I mentioned, in the in the YouTube channel. 
uh, you can go to uh, to the link and uh, please also give us your feedback for future uh, for future webinars what are the topics that uh, the audience would like to uh, to to see and again i i have to present a, a disclaimer that any of the opinions and conclusions or recommendations expressed <laughs> by anyone during this uh, webinar although are those of the individuals and do not represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, uh, or uh, Medicine. So with that, uh, John, uh, this was a, a, an incredible um, presentation. It opens a lot of questions about uh, the triggering of static liquefaction, static liquefaction. It was just that race of water a little bit that was enough to generate more pressures to bring everything to the instability or what. So uh, thank you very much for 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 your uh, for your presentations. My pleasure. Thank you.